Hi, everyone. Okay. Let's get the class started. So today we'll talk about a bit more about tokenization, word embedding, and recurrent neural networks. So as always, let's begin with uh, some quiz. So question one is true or false. Question two is true or false. There is some math question. Okay, so oh wait. All right, so I'm launching the quiz now. You have three minutes and then let's go into the, uh, I'll leave the quiz open for the, um, until 4.10 though. Oh, by the way, I'll give you the link for these slides.
Okay, so let's start lecture zero, uh, three recap. I'll leave the quiz open though. And you can take a look at the slides if you want to continue solving the quiz. Okay, sorry about that. Yep, so, um, yep, so I think these are the announcements are from the previous slides. I always forget to actually update them, but of course it's, it's gonna be uploaded today. I was trying to finish this by the class, but I'll try to upload this by 11 p.m. today. So please watch out the, um, the KLMS. Actually, not just KLMS, but um, in fact, the quiz, the assignment will be uploaded on the, the class website. I'll send out the announcement, but then you can access it on the class website, whether you're a Kai student or not. And it will be due actually in um, three weeks because tweaks from today will be actually, um, you know, Thanksgiving in Korea, as you know. So it will be three weeks. So which will be September, I believe, um, 29th. Yep. So due, due in three weeks, which is... Uh, September 29th and this Wednesday. And I'll briefly discuss about the assignment at the end of the lecture. So please stay tuned. Okay, so first of all, um, let's recap. Let's go through these pretty quickly. So first is the optimization. So we talked about the fact that a neural network is fully differentiable. And this is the really the important aspect of the neural network, the advantage of neural network compared to other things like SAT or some other optimization or um, non-differentiable problems. And the, the fact that we're formulating the problem in, into a differentiable space is basically the one of the, the biggest strengths of neural networks. And in order to uh, then, uh, what was the strength? The fact that we can compute the gradient and then basically um, move to, move the parameters toward that direction, so that you are in a better place than previously. And the the term that we use is batch gradient descent, meaning meaning that we use a lot of example. I mean, we use the entire training data to compute the gradient, and that's actually the the gradient you want to actually compute, but you approximate that by sampling one or more examples and then compute the gradient with respect to just those examples. So I think that's the answer to the quiz, uh, the quiz uh, problem number one. And this of course is sampling, it involves sampling, which means there will be some variance. And we don't want that variance to be too high, but in many cases, small variance looks like it's helpful. So and then actually allows us to actually reach a better optima in some cases. That was why in, um, uh, in more, I would say like in 2017, 2016, their um, batch size of like 16, 32 was most popular, which is a bit different from these days. And I think I said that they were not looking for the global minima, but we're looking for a good local minima that generalizes well and it's different. There are two different things. Not you're not looking for the goal minima in training data, basically. You can only know whether you're actually minimized good or not. Um, I mean, during training, only the training data, right? Because you don't see uh, test data. So what does it mean that we have a good local minima in test data? Uh, it just means that do we have a good accuracy or a good evaluation metric? It's more of a conceptual thing than something that you can really measure though. We talked about the gradient descent, how we can compute that. So um, we said that we can compute the gradients just like using the calculus and then for each weight, partial derivative of each weight, and then just minus the current weight by that, multiply by alpha, which is learning rate. And this is usually in the order of uh, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, 0 0.01, 0 0.01, or even smaller. So it's not too big usually. And then we talked about backpropagation really briefly, the fact that 
if you compute the gradient in a vanilla way, it'll be not so efficient. So you actually track your values at every layer and then you basically back propagate, which makes, enables you to compute the gradient more efficiently. And then I think I told you that if you're more interested, please uh, take a look at, um, I'll probably actually post a reading, uh, uh, maybe web page on the reading list if you're interested though. And we actually had an example how we can actually handle um, categorical input gender by translating this into one zero, one half vector, right? Zero, one, one, zero, and then, yeah. But we also saw that the it becomes a bit more tricky when the not only the input, but also the output becomes non-numeric categorical. So we said the best, uh, best uh, the most popular method is that we just do the same thing. We try to predict the one hot vector for the output. So for instance, if we're trying to predict adult, then it will be one zero corresponding to the first class and teenager will be zero one corresponding to the second class, second, second category basically. And we can still use MSC loss, uh, basically mean square error. So try to see how different our prediction and the the label, which is here, either one, zero, zero, one, different in metric space. But then in, pr in practice, this doesn't work well. Instead, we try to formulate this into a probabilistic model. We talk about that. So in order to make this into probability, we actually use softmax, which basically takes exponentiation of each value and then just compute how much that exponentiation accounts for, for the summation of all, all the exponentiations. And the good thing about this is that exponentiation always maps whether it's negative or positive to positive numbers. So you can always operate in positive space. And then also because of this uh, summation, it's pretty apparent that the if you just sum these values, then there will be sum to 1.0. So it's a valid, valid probably, probably distribution in that they sum to zero or sum to one, and also they are non-negative. And actually, when we have that now probabilistic distribution, we basically are formulating this as a probabilistic distribution. It's not, we're not saying that it's actually the true, true probability of the model. That's really also an important distinction because we're not saying that the model's output will be actually good probability. It's more of a, we are considering that as a probability. And then given the probabil probability, we want to maximize likelihood of the training data, the labels in the training data basically. And that's called MLE, maximum likelihood estimation. And other issue is that if we just do the joint probability, which will be basically this, then it will underflow. So we take logarithm at the, uh, on, on that the entire product and then we also put negative sign on it just because it's easier to actually operate in the positive space. If you take a log of probability, it will be always negative because probability is less than 1.0. So it's, it will be always like it, negative so, or zero if it, the probability is one. So if you take negative, then it will be always non-negative number and loss being zero will be the, when the probability being 1.0. So, and then we average log probabilities, uh, or in other words, actually, we basically divide this by one over N, just to actually scale this in case we have a lot of uh, examples in one case and we have a less number of examples in another case, their joint probability will be different because you have uh, more examples than trying to get them all right will be more unlikely. So that's why you actually take a one over N so that you can compare different eval evaluation data in the same scale. And also we talked about, there's a clear difference between evaluation metric and loss. Well, the, the fact that evaluation metric is a real goal, it's unchangeable, it's set by your customers or whoever made the problem, but loss is the ex expected value of the direction. And we talk about this bias and variance, the fact that uh, losses, if in, the, in, in your classification example, mostly unbiased, but then sometimes you will have a biased loss and that could be intended just because 
if you try to make it unbiased, then the variance will be really high, which makes the model very slow to train or not train at all. We're gonna see this later in the class when this happens, especially when you're trying to generate something with um, sick to sequence to sequence, for instance. So yeah, um, we want it to be unbiased and teacher forcing is one example we're gonna see. And we saw how we can approach this MNIST problem, image classification problem. This is a data set, you can take a look. And it's basically a fixed size of image with um, grayscale. And then there is some image on it by basically turning the pixel on, probably close to 1.0. Uh, this is not binary pixel, but still it's a very grayscale. There is no channel at all. Then it's very straightforward how we can formulate this with uh, the neural network that we know, because we can take the input as a vector of flattened image pixel values with times height plot time channel. And then we just try to output one of 10 classes. We, because this classification problem that we want to formulate this as a probabilistic model and then do the MLE. And then we want to use uh, something like two layer neural net. That will be the simplest model. We can go even deeper but there will be like a simple baseline with some non-linearity and with, with single ReLU activation between the two layers. But we saw that text classification is a bit difficult because output is fine because here we're trying to classify text into either positive or negative, but that uh, input is still not non-real number. And well, can we categorize this? No, because text has a lot of uh, possible categories. Um, that's impossible. So um, what, what do we do? We basically tokenize each text into categorizable units. And that's where we, got, we left off last time, right? Okay, so let's come back to quiz. So number one, okay, I'm gonna share, I'm, I'm gonna end the poll, okay? So I think it looks like everyone participated. So I'm gonna end the poll and then um, let's share. So looks like in uh, today, I think, um, yep, so good. All right, so number one, 74% people said true. And 26% said false. And the answer is true. Why? Well, I think I said that in the uh, first slide, a recap that uh, stochastic gradient descent is basically, um, it's, uh, trying to estimate or approximate the gradient descent. And it is unbiased because you just use your sampling is unbiased, right? And number two, so the gradient of likelihood function is equivalent to the gradient of its negative log likelihood. And 23% um, people said true and 77% said false. And the answer is false. And this was kind of a trick question because I think I said in the last lecture that the this is true, I'll say. Training data of a given, I'm gonna put uh, parameters here. So this is equal to negative log p of x given theta. Yeah, this is right. But then this doesn't mean taking the gradients and actually comparing those values are the same. It's just that they're, the argmax is the same. So if you actually, there, if there is such minima, then they will be same. I mean, global minima, but that doesn't mean the gradient will be the same. But turns out that actually computing gradient of a log probability is actually more stable um, because when you do softmax, you have an exponentiation, right? And then you, if you take log of it, it's actually just a bonus thing. Um, suppose that you're, when, if you, after you took the softmax, then basically if you take a log of a probability of certain value, then basically what you're trying to do is negative log of exponentiation of um, the h i, the answer, right? Um, by summation of h one to like some, a lot of uh, values, right? And if you take log of this, then because log and exp cancels out, so basically what it becomes is negative 
h i plus log. Um, my writing is bad. I'll try to write this plus because it's plus because minus minus is applied to a log of a one over a lot of things. So it becomes minus gets canceled out, right? So then what, what does it become? Um, log sum exp h i. And basically this thing, log sum exp, this is oftentimes called log sum exp. And you can actually, uh, you actually will see that actually this is actually there is a Pytorch function called log sum xp. It's exactly because of this that if you take a log of softmax, then the uh, these values becomes some log sum xp. Log sum xp is very numerically stable. And then what's really important here is also this value. And it's good because you don't have anything in front of it, and that's your loss. It's after taking log, so it's your loss. So it's very good. Very, um, you know, I would say uh, elegant. That's why um, taking log is also a good idea in general. Your gradient will be much more numerically stable. So, and then lastly, um, suppose x equal to 100 comma one. And actually I'm quite happy that actually most people got this right. This was also, I think, relatively maybe not easy question, but um, the, uh, people had different, I had four options and looks like 62% um, uh, of people got right. It's 1.0 and 0, 0.0. And I think I could see why some people was thinking this could be uh, 0.99 or 0.999. So, but then the point I wanted to make, especially without using the compute calculator is because I wanted, I want it, want, wanted you to actually basically grasp the idea of exponentiation. And because softmax is exponentiation of 101, it's there, the, the difference between them is huge. e to the power of 100, if you try to actually you know, estimate this, there are several ways probably, right? Um, this is probably what, bigger than two to the power of 100, right? Because e is bigger than two. And then two to the power of 100 is bigger than 10 to the power of 10, right? Because, um, two to the power of 10 is 1024, which is bigger than 10. So this is really large, right? This is basically 10 billion, right? Whereas e to the power of one apparently is just, um, it's, this is definitely smaller than 10. So then the difference between these two is like billion times. So it's definitely closer to 1.0 than 0 0.999. Okay, so let's begin. Um, actually, I'm gonna uh, stop share and I'm gonna download this just in case I forget. Just done. All right, so let's begin our uh, today's uh, new materials. Okay, so what does it mean that, coming back to the um, tokenization, that we want to tokenize this into categorizable units? So it's apparent that this entire text is probably not so much categorizable because you will probably never see exactly the same sentence as your input. And that's really problematic because there, there are infinite number of categories without any uh, overlap between training and test time. But how about we, if we split this into say using space, then um, the first token will be this, second token is isn't a fantastic movie with comma and but rather Semi good with comma, right? And probably you will see a lot of. Um, um, I mean, there are also, of course, tricks like you can ignore uppercase, lowercase, 
Let's not do that for, for now. Let's say just uh, we don't do anything. But then still, you will see a lot of, uh, right? This will be very, very frequent. And a, a lot of fantastic too, not as much as uh, the right movie a lot, isn't of course a lot, um, but a lot, rather a lot. So then maybe then we can have a fixed or at least like a manageable number of categories that each token, this unit is called token, this each thing is token, uh, is contained in. So that's the whole purpose of tokenization actually. So it's very simple. You want to, if your entire input is so long or very unique that it's very uh, not categorizable, then you want to split that into categorizable units. And it's your choice how, how, how much you want to tokenize, right? So I just did very easy tokenization. This will be in Python, will be just like, uh, if this is uh, just sentence, then it will be just sent, sent, sent that split and probably space. Or in fact, um, it, it's a quick tip that if you just actually do without any parameter to the function, then actually it will split by white space, including like tab or special white, white spaces. So um, just that, that's a tip actually when you're working on your um, assignments. That's great. But then we clearly see that this is not probably ideal, right? Why is that? As we said, the, the word this, the T is uppercase just because that word is the first word. But you might want to actually compare it and then consider it to be equivalent to a word that's in the middle of the sentence and thus not uppercase T. So then maybe you want to lowercase it, right? How about isn't? Isn't is um, technically is not. So do you want to actually compare isn't with is not? Or we want to actually consider it as a special word? So that's one uh, example. And it's also possible to actually split this isn't with, um, for instance, is and apostrophe n and apostrophe t. Because n is basically just um, shorthand for not, right? And t is just shorthand for not. So maybe you want to split isn't into these two words, is and not, and, and t. And then maybe, this n apostrophe t can be considered same as not, right? How about comma? You, uh, the comma is attached to movie just because that's how you write English. But then technically what they mean is that the comma is separate from movie, semantically, right? So you actually want to split this into movie and comma, right? And how about semi-good? Semi-good also maybe because it's kind of prefix. So you, you might want to separate this into uh, three words, which is semi-dash um, and good. So now you see that you, uh, although the splitting by space is a quite straightforward way to tokenize it and probably not too bad, but then still you can do better by basically introducing these rules. And of course, I just introduced like three rules in one sentence and you can probably imagine there will be a lot of rules if you are talking about the entire English. And because the tokenization is really important for NLP and also actually it's also important for um, you know, linguistics. So that's actually why I have, people have been working a lot on these rules. What would be the best way to tokenize an English sentence? And once, so, and so, but then what, one of the important actually requirements before you create a tokenizer is that how you define your vocab. Actually vocab construction and tokenization is actually their kind of dual problem. It's not, I cannot say one is actually done before the other. One has to be done with respect to the other, but let's talk about vocab construction first. So what does that mean? So then how many categories at the end you want to have? for each token. So how many tokens do we have here? If we use these, this like a, a simple way of Y split, then there was no overlapping words. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight words, right? But then if you use this, oh yeah, by the way, thank you for pointing out. So, um, sorry, I missed your chat, apparently. It's very hard for me to actually focus on the chat, but then uh, from uh, Choi Sang-yeop, yeah, you're right. I think 
I had a mistake. This is Arcman. Yep, so actually, and apparently actually, maybe this, I, I intend this to be trick question, but maybe you thought this is false just because there is negative. Yeah, but even if there was no negative, then still they are not equal, right? And um, thank you for your correction. And from Soro, are the commas including the tokens? Yeah, so that's what I was gonna just say, which is basically, yep, the commas, can be or can or maybe uh, can be, but then still it's good idea not to include in the, uh, I mean, it's good to include the commas token, but then not with movie here. There are two different things, right? You want to consider comma as a separate token, not something that's attached to movie. And if you actually use this some a bit more complex rule, then how many tokens do we have? Then we have, um, we have a one, Two, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, right? And then maybe this will be our vocab. Then in that case, the vocab size will be twelve because um, you have twelve words in your training data. In practice, of course, your training data will be more than one sentence. So you're basically look at like a ten to I mean, like millions of sentences, for instance, and then just collect all the, all the words and then of course remove uh, some frequent ones and you can construct your not <laughs> remove frequent ones we basically just consider unique words and basically that becomes your vocab but then there are actually one important thing that is that we need a sp special category called unc it stands for unknown that handles tokens that were not seen during training and why is this important because of course, during training, if you actually construct vocab with all the words that you, you saw in training data, and by definition, your vocab will have 100% coverage on your training data, but you will miss some words in the validation or test data because it's impossible, almost impossible to actually, not actually entirely imp impossible, but to cover all the words, you will see some unknown words. And also, if you have seen only one once or twice of a certain word, then probably in many neural network training scenario, you will not be able to train much for that word. So it's good to actually create a vocab on some training corpus where you have, say for instance, something like at least 10 times of occurrence or five times, enough number of times. And if it hasn't appeared that many times, then you can consider your um, those unfrequent words to be unk during training too, so that you have seen the word unk during training as well. And that's really important too, right? Because if you only see unk during test, not during training, there is no way the model will be able to handle unk. And all these categories, including unk is called vocab, vocabulary. So it's a set. So how can we construct a vocab? And there are probably two choices, right? Um, number one, okay. So there was a question actually. What do you mean by corpus? So corpus is just set of text. Yeah, it's very simple. Corpus is just set of text. Okay, and another question. For a new word like A, B, C, D, E, any advantages to represent an ANC versus E, G, A, B, C, D, E? All, so basically you mean like a, all separately, right? That's a very good point actually. So what you're saying actually is that, okay, there might be unknown words, but then there is no unknown characters, right? Because we know that there is a finite number of characters, especially in English, then you have at most like what, 27 characters and including um, special characters, even then 100 characters. So we can consider each character to be a word. Then basically we can just, cover every word, right? So then there's a, uh, uh, two directions, right? One is then, okay, let's just go character level, everything. And this was actually a popular method, especially to handle a very, um, you know, these a freak, uh, uh, rare words. But then it turns out that the character level makes the text too long, that the mod modeling becomes very inefficient. So I would say um, these days, we're not 100% uh, character level. And in the 
earlier earlier days we were using some character level but then we were not 100% dependent on the character level it was more of a maybe hybrid between character level and word level for most cases i would say and that that's like basically uh the the first reason but then first way but then the second way that we can consider maybe is that can we just fall back to characters when we don't when we don't know just it's, i think maybe that's what you meant like for the onwards when we think we don't know then can can we just for can can't we just fall back to character level and your answer is actually correct and uh, my answer is actually yes and, and in fact actually that's the right now the, the standard way um that it's we're gonna cover that pretty soon. Um, something like VP by pair encoding, for instance, actually can utilize that. And then you might ask, why ha why haven't we done that before? Then VP was in NLP was introduced like in 2015, and I would say we didn't know that it would be effective. So I think what's what seems to be apparent now was not so so much apparent back then. I would say, yeah. But uh, so we're gonna go go to actually BP. But then even for BP, um, not maybe you don't because when we go to Unicode level, not just ASCII characters, then you might also have onc character, right? Because you, you might not want to cover every Unicode character because there are so many. Um, so there are finite, but there are so many. So then in that case, you still might need onc. So it's good to actually say assume that there is always an onc. Then there are two choices to construct the vocab. So number one is that you can use a pre-built dictionary by humans for the vocab. And this means just, you know, bring your Oxford um, dictionary or your favorite dictionary and then use those words for your vocab. And choice number two is probably what we kind of assumed is that you can build a vocab using your training data, just tokenize using your tokenizers, and then just take a look at all the words, you know, bring them and then make a set of it without you know, overlapping tokens, then that will be your vocab. Of course, this training data doesn't have to be equivalent to your task training data. It's, uh, it, it's good to actually include it, but then it doesn't have to be. Um, so, and we'll see what that means soon, but... <clears throat> But um, it's actually, but then in in uh, in general, they are actually using the same training data for um, very. Um, so there, I'll actually come back to that. There, there, there are some reasons that why people haven't used um, other data than training data, and there are also reasons why people started to use other data than training data, and that's actually because of a pre-trained word embedding that we're gonna see next um, lecture, not probably today's lecture. But um, for now, let's say that you use your training data, same training data, because anyway, you're gonna use these words to train your model. And then if you haven't seen your word in during training training, then there is no way you can handle that anyways. So why even give it um, some dedicated embedding? I mean, not, I mean, dedicated position in one hot vector. So let's get back to that soon. So I think uh, for care construction is very straightforward, same sentence, then basically here, if we if our corpus is really small like that, of course, our corpus will be much bigger than this, several documents, I mean, like millions of documents like Wikipedia. But then if, we're, if our corpus is very small, then we use this corpus as our training data to construct the vocab there. If we do just space, um, tokenization, then there will be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight words. So you have uh, eight words in your vocab. If we use that more complex tokenizer, then, then it will be, was it like 11, 12? Yeah. Okay, so um, we're going to take a five minute break until 445, and then we're going to cover the rest of the lectures.
Okay, welcome back. All right, so now then, what kind of tokenizers are there? So we talk about white space based tokenizer. So split by just white space. It's very simple, just send that split and close your parenthesis, that's it. But there are a few issues with this. We saw that if the word is like long or there are like some hyphens in the middle, then, and also it will cause a lot of unks. You cannot compare between, for instance, um, uppercase T and lowercase T words. There are some delimiters. There are like, you know, apostrophes, commas, these like um, punctuations that cannot be handled. Another method is that you can do vocab based tokenizer, which is that you're given a vocab and then choose a token in the vocab that matches the next character. If there are more than one, then choose the longest. So I think this is very similar to what uh, Yunyoung said. And basically, if it's unk, then let's just fall back to like a shorter one. And it can be as short as a character, right? But then, um, and uh, probably you can cover 99% of characters. And it, so it turns out to be very simple and effective, right? So actually, I mean, it turns out to be very simple and effective with a good vocab. And I think I talk about this, right? Uh, so what's not so obvious actually until about very recently. So if you actually thought about this independently, then I think you're very, uh, I would say, yeah, that's very good because people were not able to think of that like six years ago. I will, to be more exact, people thought about it, but then they never thought it would be so much effective. And you can actually do more complex tokenizers. You can go to like Spacey and LTK and then bring these really uh, complex tokenizers that just is made of super long regular expression. And these are also great in many cases, but um, these days they are more and more being replaced by the vocab, vocab based the train took basically tokenizer in some sense. And we call that actually, um, oh, what happened? Okay, so looks like I'm, I'm missing here, sorry. Um, and that's actually, I'm gonna talk about by pair encoding that's basically corresponding to this vocab based tokenizer. And it's data driven tokenizer, which means that your tokenizer actually, the behavior depends on your vocab and also, it's basically kind of being trained. And the idea is simple. So given characters or training text data, we call this corpus. Corpus and text data is basically the same thing. But it's just that you don't actually um, say like super small text data to be corpus. So corpus is usually a really big thing, like millions or billions of sentences. And then what bipart encoding does is that given training data, you find the most frequent pair and replace that pair with a new token, a new, new special symbol, basically. I think that's a better way to say. And then now you have introduced one more symbol to this training data. And, but then you made your training data shorter, right? Because you, your pair got replaced by one symbol. So you got shorter, now you have shorter text data and then you just repeat this. X times. So how does that work in practice? So suppose that you're given this long sequence and we can even consider space to be a space or Y space to be a special sequence too, right? And we see that the most common pair here is AA. So because it occurs here, also occurs here, it occurs here, occurs here. But we do, we actually go, uh, we, we actually go from left to right in a unidirectional manner. So you first replace the AA into Z, then there's no more AA, right? So this actually um, gets skipped. And then you turn the next AA into Z and then you actually skip the, uh, the next because there is no way. 
So then that's why Z becomes AA and it's efficient, right? Because you have to just pass once when you're going from this step one to uh, iterate from one to two. So this is iteration one. This is iter two and this is iter three. And then after we have done that, we we see that now Z Z actually A B is more most frequent because they occur twice. So we played we place that with Y. That's why uh, we have introduced just a new symbol Y, right? And now what? What's the most frequent symbol? A pair, actually. Now then ZY is most frequent uh, pair. So now we actually pair this ZY into what? X. And that's why now we even have a shorter sentence um, with um, now three more symbols. So we, how many symbols did we have initially? We had A, B, C, D. So we had four symbols. And then now we have three more symbols. So now vocab size became what? Um, initially vocab size was three or four, but then now it becomes five. And apparently in each iteration, your vocab size increases by one, right? And how bipair encoding works, I think it can differ actually depending on the exact implementation, but the overall idea is very similar and very simple. You basically start with the, the character level tokens or vocab, and then you add software level or uh, basically longer, sim uh, longer, longer symbols, long, longer, lo longer symbols. And you, it's guaranteed that your vocab size will be exactly how many times you iterate because you only replace that with one new symbol. So then, then you might wonder, so then if this happens, then what happens to um, these characters, DNA and C? And the point is that DAC are no, 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 there and X, X, Y, Z, they are not different after this, these things have been done. They're just um, special symbols. They're just symbols in the vocab and they, they are treated exactly uh, same as um, to each other, basically. But then um, of course, it's better to replace longer one than shorter one. So. So now what happens if we now get an input of, uh, let's take a, now this is training time, right? This is training time. And let's suppose that in the, this is train. And now during, um, not test time, I would say, but this is training time of the bipair encoding, not training time of the model. So the testing this bipair encoding can be on the training data. Hopefully that's clear. Then after you have created your tokenizer and your vocab, I mean, basically after you created your vocab, then you, your tokenizer is very simple. The tokenizer always comes up, comes with this vocab. And then suppose your text is something like, like that, okay. Mm. This? Yep. Then in that case, then how do we actually tokenize this into these symbols? So let's take a look at A. Yes, good. A is, a is actually already in our vocab because we have all the characters in our vocab, but then we want to see if we can go longer. So let's check if AB is in our vocab. And we see that, oh, AB is in our vocab. Y equal AB. So that's great. Okay, let's make... Uh, let's put that, let's store that, but then let's also see if ABC is in our um, vocab. But unfortunately we don't have any token that's corresponding to ABC. So AB is the longest token. So that's why you can split here. All right? And then now let's look at the C. How about C? Do we have any special symbol that start with C? No. So then in this case, then we just basically want to um, just use the single character C as our next token. And how about A? Yes, A is, in, is a, a character, but then how about AA? We do have AA, which is Z. And how about AAA? Well, we do not have AAA, but then we know that we do have um, AAAB, right? So then 
we can replace that to zy and x, I mean. So then that's why this will be tokenized until here. So now we just tokenize this text of how many characters, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven characters into three tokens. So pretty simple, right? Very simple method. Is it clear? Let me know if you have any question. Okay, nice. Let's move to next slide. Okay, so we have almost every piece together to make our text classifier, but one last thing is that the input length, unlike the image, is variable. Of course, image input length can be also varied, but then the good thing about image is that you can actually resize it very easily. Well, without losing the information much, right? Of course, you will lose a lot of information if you actually make this image very thin or very wide, then yeah, but then in many cases with reasonable resizing, you won't lose information. But then it's very not so intuitive and probably not possible to resize text. Okay, there's a question. Is n repeat needed until no substitution? Um, what do you mean by n repeat? あ、オッケー。くトリシナよ。ね、ごめんなさい。で、いけ、AP를 so um because there are some English speakers I'll actually try to um Yep, uh, put in English. So your question is whether the, so, so whether we can, we should repeat this until there is no substitution. And uh, it really depends on implementation. So um, there are several ways to implement this. One is that you can just actually, this is just a substitution rule, but then at the end, X is equal to A, 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 B, right? So in that case, then what you're trying to do is you want to replace this to, um, directly to AAB. That's like one kind of one way of implementation. But as you said, there it's also it could be also possible to actually do a iterative um, substitution, which is then at first you uh, put this into AA, which will be um, Z. And then you translate this to Y and then you can actually, uh, you can find out that this can be replaced with X. So I think the, 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 the point is here is that there are several ways to actually do that. So there isn't, I, I think, a one single way of doing it. Okay, next question is, um, should be the length of each token fixed by two, not the three or four? Um, what do you mean by it should be fixed? by two. Mm. Yeah, if you can clarify, it would be good. So length of each took, yeah. Yeah, so at the end, the AAB will be treated as one token, yeah. Well, because you introduce new symbols, so 
Um, Okay, so let's go one by one. Yeah, thank you for your questions though. Okay, so, so um, at the end, the AAB can be treated as one token. So the, the bokeh will grow larger. It will not be always two letter words. So I think as uh, Yunyoung pointed out, so, but then, how we ended up there, we'll, we have intermediate symbols like a Z and Y, and they can be also used as vocab. If of course you have a AA, but not a -A -A -B. So it's not that they are, um, you know, completely there. They have some, they have naturally um, X is basically composed of Z, Y. So basically, if you can replace the word with X, then you can also replace that with Z and Y. But then the tokenization rule will be that you're, you're trying to choose the longest one. So that you can actually have a shorter um, number of uh, basically input sequence. Okay, and the next question is, what will happen if we hypothetically have a vocab of X, A, A, and um, A, B, 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 and we have a sequence of AABB, which would get replaced to XBBB. Yeah, so what, what, you're, what you said is right. So I think that's the same question as the, what Mario said, right? Because um, how can we actually prevent um, non-optimal case when, um, so basically you have uh, these cases where you actually place that with X and that actually results in non-optimal case in the, in the latter case. So in, in fact, I mean, uh, yeah, so there, there actually, so let me actually, so first thing is that, as you said, it is true. If we actually try to encode in this manner, then it will be what you said will occur. So non-optimal case basically, because your length will not be shortened to the maximum degree. I think that's what Myra said too, right? Checking. If, uh... So here, the I think uh, what I want to say first is that uh, what I just described, as you said, is not optimal. And let me get back to this next lecture. Actually, I'll also have to check up if um, what would be the um, in general the the right answer to this, sorry about that. But you, what you said is right. This is not, not optimal, what, what I said is. Yeah, but I'll actually come back to the next lecture. I think, good, okay. But really good question, yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, so about handling variable input length. So we have to um, now go into how can we handle variable input length? And actually one thing I wanted to say about this is that, well, for a long time, actually people were very, I would say very um, obsessed with the, the fact that length can be variable. And that's why people introduce like different techniques like RNNs because they can actually handle variable length. But it turns out that in practice, especially in the modern NLP, it's more practical to just fix the input size and then pad some special tokens if it's shorter and truncate, or you can actually use other methods if the actual input is longer. Then you can always assume that the number of tokens in your input is always same. Okay, so uh, actually, and one, one thing actually, one more thing, actually, before I go into neural networks. So there was a question from GitHub, so I'm gonna actually answer that too. So uh, really quickly, I forgot to come back to that. So question from uh, MJ73 was that uh, there was a quiz in last um, lecture that, um, Deep learning methods might want to increase model size to prevent overfitting, but it's quite confusing that it could sometimes increase and sometimes decrease the model size to prevent overfitting. 
which is all the options I got. So I could you briefly recap the options that I can choose based on the size of the data set? Um, yeah, so here's the point. So I think really the uh, number, of, first, first of all, what I'm saying can be relatively more of a conjecture than a truth because I think everyone's conjecturing these days, right? But then the about the model size. So I wanted to mention that um, model size, and so the fact that the so when 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 you're overfitting to a, a certain data set, it could mean two two different things. One is that your model is not able to learn the the real thing in the the, the relationship between the data set that it's trying to basically memorize, right? So it's not really learning the relationship, but kind of memorizing it. So that's like what, what might be happening. Number two is, well, um, I'll say the, you're, you basically just give the, uh, you basically go to the uh, global, global minima of the training data, which probably is actually overfitted. So what the, what's the difference between those two? Well, well, probably in the number one case, maybe they're the same thing, but um, I think it's a bit different. So I think, but I, I see your um, motivation here though. So your uh, motivation to your question is um, how I think, so I guess like uh, your really question is which option should I choose if I have a, um, I'm, I'm, I'm observing some of this overfitting. And so I think this depends on the size of data. So if the size of data is too small, then it's very likely that you will not be able to gain much by just increasing the data and not increasing the model size. So when the data is very small, then, then the, the overfitting is more likely probably for larger, larger models. But then when the data is sufficiently large, then you will start to see that the, it's really hard to overfit the uh, large models. And in that case, then probably you want to make your model bigger. So it really depends on, I think, your data. Of course, this is not uh, considering there is a pre-trained pre data. If you have pre-training data, then everything changes. But if you don't have a pre-trained data when you're training from scratch, then it is likely that um, there is basically inflection point. When the data size is too small, then probably um, you want to control your um, model size to go down. But then if, if your data is bigger than a certain amount, then you want to increase your model size. I'll say that's like in the order of uh, at least like uh, tens of hundreds of thousands though. And usually that size is. Okay, so hopefully I gave uh, answer to your question on the GitHub q &As. So please feel free to ask more questions later. But yeah, I'm a bit behind. So um, I'll try to cover this really quickly. So now we have a text classification model for, um, no, neural networks for text classification. We're ready for that because now we have tokenized the input into these tokens and now our input lengths can be four. And if you turn this into a uh, one half vector, then it will be zero, one, zero, zero, zero because they're of uh, uh, vocab size five, and then you have four tokens. So you have four vectors of uh, um, size five vectors. So that's why your input size will be four, four by five and output size is two because we're still working on this positive or negative review, right? And then um, one thing I wanted to point out actually here is that, okay, so your input size is um, then Four by, four, by, four by five, right? Because you have four tokens, four um, fixed size tokens, and then you have uh, five dimensions in each vector. And then let's say that we actually map this to with a, uh, some linear layer. And then we have a first hidden state in this real network, which is um, suppose with this linear transformation. Um, so then you're basically talking about something like uh, without activation for now. Right, so this will be our first transformation. 
And I wanted to point out that this W1 is very interesting matrix. It, it, that's because X is one half vectors. So if the X is one half vector, that, that means that whatever you uh, basically extract from W, again, I said the other way. If X is one half vectors, then if you apply X to W1, then what you actually do is that you're basically just indexing or just basically getting the vector that corresponds to that position in W1. So what does that mean? Because W1 will be, um, what's the dimension of W1? This will be, um, well, you're multiplying X to the, uh, at, at the right. So it will be, um, should be something five times five and your output will be say hidden state size D. Then W is D by five matrix and you're multiplying this to X. And this will be then D by phi matrix, right? So this is like here. And if you're multiplying one half vector to this one half vector or a matrix composed of one half vectors, then what you get out of it is that, for instance, let's say you apply this 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, this vector. If you apply that to this, then you're basically just extracting this, the, the, the second vector, right? Because um, that's because if you multiply this to um, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, then this thing will be just multiplied to here and other things all zero. So you only get this entire column vector out. So you get the point, what this is doing. The, what the one half vector basically is doing when there, there is linear transformation on top of that is basically just getting the vector out from the embedding matrix. So that's why, I mean, I shouldn't say embedding matrix because I never use that term, but then basically this W1. That's why we call it word embedding because this each embedding at the column vector here is corresponding to each word. You are basically just indexing that vector in that, in that matrix. So that's why we call this W1. W1 is word embedding. And, and also because of that, um, we usually don't put bias on top of it and we don't actually put um, um, activation, so no activation, and we do not put bias on top of it. And then we do not usually call this a layer just because it, the linear transformation is not really happening here. So, and I mean, and also uh, it's by convention, we don't call this word embedding a layer. We usually call whatever comes on top of the word embedding a layer. But then I wanted to point this out because Word embedding is technically a linear layer with one half vector inputs, but then um, we just have conventions that we're not calling that um, layer. And also we don't put activation on top of it. So it's a bit different from other layers. And why is not linear transformation? Because it's just one half vector. You're not linearly adding things from different, different dimensions. We're just one half vector. So you're basically just bringing that vector corresponding to um, that dimension in that matrix. So that's why there isn't any linear transformation happening in this linear layer. It's just basically lookup. That's people call it lookup too, yeah, because it's kind of indexing. So is this clear, hopefully? So yeah, again, the point is that uh, it's very some. It's actually same as with, it's it's exactly a linear layer without bias and activation, but that we do not call it linear layer. That's the point, the whole point. Okay, so I'm gonna try to end here um, with word embedding too. So, um, okay, then it makes sense that applying um, a linear transformation on one half vector is computationally inefficient because it's more, you know, okay, so is X transpose here? You mean here? Well, yeah, so I mean, transposition can happen, of course. I mean, I'm not, uh, so technically, so what people do actually is that instead of uh, formulating this, uh, this as W1X, what people always do is that they put W1 after X in um, computer science. So you can do 
x w1 right then in that case what x will be um instead of four times five oh you're right sorry yeah you're absolutely right sorry about that i made a like really big mistake here yep that's right so um this should be x is because four times four 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 times four x five so we want to uh, operate this on the five side so uh, we want to apply W1 like that. And here then W1 will be shape of uh, five times D. Then in that case, then this will not be column vectors, but instead, um, row vector. Okay, yeah, so, um, so thank you for pointing out. Yes, wait. Um, that's that's right. And in that case, um, another question is that can we avoid learnable embedding layer? Well, so for now, no, right? Because then it will be just random vectors, right? But then we can do that if we have pre-trained word embeddings. So we're gonna see that next lecture. But then for now, we are assuming that there is no pre-trained embedding. We're assuming that we're training everything from scratch in our uh, training data. So in that case, then the answer is no at the moment. But later, yes, we can avoid learnable embedding layer. Okay. So I want to just conclude with this word embedding. Um, so it's inefficient. So in practice, we use the vocab IDs as the input and index the word embedding matrix using the IDs. So in PyTorch, this will be uh, torch.nn.embedding. And one hot vectors, then in this case, um, instead of using this one of vectors, we just use vocab IDs, our inputs, because one corresponds to the position one, zero corresponds to position zero, uh, two, and four, right? And then we have an embedding matrix of size five times D. So I did this here correct, right? This is basically W. Then you can basically have your input and then you multiply this by, I'll, I'll call this E because it's not, um, weights but more of a i mean it's their weights but that we call it embedding so then x times z basically but then we don't want to compute this because this is inefficient so we instead just look up and look up is much faster on cpus okay so we're, we're going to end this uh, here um so it's a bit unfortunate that we couldn't cover the um rnns today but i think it's more important to actually go um uh, actually have a good pace for everyone to understand the uh, all the materials, but I'll try to be a bit more fast on Monday next week. So we're going to cover RNNs and also a bit more details about assignment one, but assignment one will be released today though. So you can start working on it if you know these things. Um, I, I mean, it's also kind of self-explanatory, so it would be not too hard for you to actually work on it yourself. Um, so I'm going to just have a really quick poll. just to see where everyone is at. Um, sorry for... Okay, so let's have this poll really quickly and then just end the class by 520 at least.
Okay, so just 10 more seconds. And I'm gonna just end here. Okay, thank you for your poll. So um, looks like I think 70% understood all, 30% some issues. Okay, that's good. I'm gonna download this. Okay, thank you everyone. So I'm gonna see you on Monday and please stay tuned for the assignment upload announcement today by 11 p.m. Thanks a lot.